Hi, everyone, and welcome to our mental health and substance use series called Recovery Out Loud. With us today is Andrea Horowitz. She is the clinical director for Harbor Village in Florida, and her expertise is in substance use disorders and working with those individuals who are struggling with addiction. Hi, Andrea. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Glad to be here. So today we'll just dive right into the topic of boundaries, what they are, why everyone needs them, and how they are directly related to addiction. Um, so my first question will be just basically, can you talk us through, you know, we use that term boundaries all the time, but what in your view are boundaries? So boundaries are really setting limits for ourselves. I mean, so what happens in substance abuse is that we let go of those boundaries. And sometimes it's due to trauma, it's due to substance abuse, it's due to guilt and to shame. And those boundaries get very loose and, you know, they get loose and sometimes they can even get very rigid. And sometimes we don't let people in that we should be letting in. So it can be caused by a combination of substance abuse and, you know, trauma. So it's either one or the other or even both. Why is it so hard to see where those lines are? And does that have to do with your own understanding of yourself? So like if you don't understand how you feel or you don't have clarification about what you are, who you are, does that create fuzziness or grayness in terms of setting boundaries with other people? Yeah, sure. So boundaries, we can look at it in, the, in two ways. So when you are feeling, you know, a lot, a lot that's related to substance abuse is very people pleasing skills or right. Because, you know, there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of shame about, using and then the behaviors that come along with using. So what happens is, is that you want people to like you, you want to be loved. And so you'll open up all these doors and these, you know, like what we would say, it's like you're opening up the fence in your yard and you're letting everybody in. And sometimes it's really harder to define when you're not clear headed, you know, which ones are the good ones to let into your property, which the ones we should let, you know, keep outside, keep outside of the fence. And because, you know, you don't feel good about what you've been doing and you know, right from wrong, but of course, you know, using, you know, kind of like to tears us from making good choices. And so, and boundaries can also be kind of like not knowing which boundaries to keep, especially if you have trauma. And, you know, so you can learn at a very, very young age that people impede on those on those boundaries. And so that's normal. And so, you, you know, you find a lot of people, especially with sexual trauma, you know, really don't have any boundaries about themselves. And that to them is very normal. So we do speak a lot about boundaries and protecting ourselves and self-respect. And it goes along a lot with our values. And are these things that you start to address as during the process of detox or after detox? Because I heard you mention, you know, having clarity or being clear in your thoughts, it seems to me that that would be very hard to do under the influence, obviously. So as you're bringing people in and you're beginning the process of detox, is that when um, perhaps things that people were once avoiding, emotions that they were once avoiding or situations they didn't want to face start coming up? And that's where some of that clarity comes into play, but also a lot of pain. Yes, definitely. You know, you're coming into detox, you're losing the only solution and the only coping skill that you did have. Mm -hmm. So you're coming in, you're making a decision, I'm not going to drink or use anymore. But now you don't have anything to replace it. 
So what happens is all these emotions get flooded. They all come up at once and you're feeling everything at once. You're feeling happy. You're feeling sad. You're feeling frustrated. You're feeling irritable. You, you know, they're just all happening at once. And it could be very, very overwhelming. So do we start to talk about these things even at the detox level? Yes, because we start to plant the seed. And everybody's detox and everybody's sense of self is different. And we always meet a client where they're at. So there's sometimes that a client could come in and be ready to absorb it from the get-go. And others just need time to like sit back, kind of like catch the breath a little bit. And that's where, you know, we're good. That's where we keep our boundaries. You know, we understand that too. So we meet a client where they're at. And if they need time to sit and have it, you know, their emotions and cry and, you know, we're there and, you know, holding them and protecting them and letting them know this is okay. It's okay to feel. We're not here to judge. We don't judge the feelings. And we kind of are teaching them that they shouldn't be judging their feelings either. And to just let it be. It's interesting because um, the more that I learn about this, as the person who's struggling with addiction begins to change, begins to have that clarity, um, it from the outside, it almost changes the whole dynamic with those around them, doesn't it? So I'm wondering how you differentiate between setting boundaries or punishing behavior. like. Sometimes from the outside, right, boundaries get set and it almost feels from the outside because it's such a change, like you're getting punished. So can you kind of talk us through the difference there and and how to kind of distinguish that difference? Sure. So punishment is really control. And boundaries is something that we do for ourselves. It sets clear limits for ourselves. So and it's also an internal motivation opposed to external. So punishing again looks like very controlling. And if you continue to do this, this is what's going to happen. Um, or, you know, I'm not going to love you or, you know, you're not going to be able to come home. But th it could also look like very clear set boundaries. And what happens is an addiction the boundaries for themselves are, it, it can get very confusing because they feel like if they set a boundary with somebody like i you know you may not talk to me that way then they can hear that as you don't love me i'm not good enough i'm not lovable but, you know i'm bad and so what we try to teach them is to set boundaries for themselves that it gives them some self-respect and their own control. So it, it, it kind of can sound very confusing, but if you think about it in terms of like, if we think about it in terms of kids, right? So boundaries would look like, you know, I'm setting a boundary that, you know, you do all your work, you know, you do your schoolwork and then you can go do things opposed to like, you'll never be able to go out again unless you're going to do your work. And it sounds very different. And it's, it's just new skills. And the way it's set, it, it's, it's just new for them. And it's, it could be very scary. It sounds like what you're saying is that when you set boundaries, you're, you're setting the limit, but with an option for healing versus where punishment, there's, there's no way to heal out of it. It is just, um, just a punishment. Is that, does that sound right to you? That's exactly it. That, that was a great way of saying it. And punishments are threats. Yeah. So where boundaries are positive. And it's, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Can it finish your thought? Um, no, that it, it's just basically that, you know, punishment you can look at as threats and boundaries we look at as, um, as being positive. Another interesting notion is this idea of separateness. 
Um, and I wanted to address that too, because isn't it the, isn't it the, the idea is with addiction, your separateness as your own entity, as your own self, as the things you like, the things you don't like, um, become blurred. And then as, as you learn to set boundaries, you're kind of learning who you are as a separate person from everything else. So can you talk about that some? Because I think that's just so significant to recovery um, and the gray lines that exist within addiction. Sure. So what happens with the disease of addiction is everything's blurred. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not making good choices. Your judgment is off. Your insight is off. And, you know, there's part of you that knows right from wrong. And there's this other part that kind of takes over. So there are no boundaries. You don't even have boundaries with yourself, right? Because the boundaries with yourself would be like, I don't want to pick up today. But those get blurred because you're powerless over it. So, you know, until you get the help and know there's a different way to cope with your emotions, to cope with day-to-day life challenges. And that's just what boundaries look like. So what happens is that we're, you know, it's really just setting boundaries for yourself. And how does that start to look? And, you know, it's selfish. It can look as being selfish. And that's very scary for somebody in recovery. Because what you're taught is that the disease makes you selfish. But in recovery, we tell you, you need to be selfish. So that's really can be very confusing and a confusing boundary. But I, oh, sorry. um, You're not, you you know, you're saying something so interesting, which is it's scary, um, but actually on the flip side, empowering. And so like, how do you bridge that gap? Because the terror of stepping out and becoming selfish yet empowered in a way that actually improves all the relationships in your life. Um, So that just almost from the outside doesn't make any sense. Have you seen clients feel so empowered after taking those really scary steps towards boundaries and separateness? Yeah, it's really incredible. You know, I've been doing this for over 16 years, um, residential treatment. And it's really amazing to watch somebody surrender. And that's really what you're talking about and boundary setting, right? Because now they're surrendering. They're just saying that I can't do this on my own. I need help. And that's where boundaries are great because you're allowing people in to help you. So when we talk about boundaries, we talk about you know, allowing the people in who love you, who want to protect you, who have your back, who are not going to judge you and allow them in your hula hoop and allow the ones that are not helpful, who are out there to hurt you, who don't have your best interests and keep them on the outside. But that gets very confusing when you are in the throes of your addiction. So yes, while you're in recovery and we are beginning to see that process, they're beginning to see that self is is okay. Like I am okay with me and it's okay that I am an addict because now I'm getting help. I love what you're saying because, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you might have learned maybe love or what love is in a wrong way and not know who to let in and who to keep on the on the outside. And isn't that why the guidance of treatment, the guidance of therapy through this whole process is so important? Because how is someone going to know that unless you have someone with this kind of expertise guiding them through. There's this notion out in society. It's like, you know, you just need to, you need to quit. You need to make some good choices for yourself and you just need to, but it, it's, that's, that's really a fallacy, isn't it? You, it isn't it very hard to, how are you going to learn all this by yourself? So can you sure. kind of like 
buck up against those notions. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so really the disease of addiction is this. Dis means separated from ease. So dis-ease, you were separated from ease. So if somebody could have just stopped, they would have stopped. Why would have they lost their families, lost their children, lost jobs? Um, you know, even those who have had legal trouble. It's not that they want to wake up and say, like, this is a good plan. So if they could have stopped, they would have stopped. And so, yes, from the outside, you say like, okay, just put it down. Can't you see what's happening? But the disease is so strong. And what we really do at Harbor Village is really help you understand what you're up against. And this all comes into like learning boundaries, right? Because they didn't know there was boundaries. I, I didn't know I can say no and still be loved. I didn't even know that I can say no and that would still be okay. And you're right. Do we learn that from childhood? Most definitely, yes. So, you know, there's little traumas, there's big traumas, you know, sometimes needs are not met and those get crossed and, you know, and then we lose what a boundary is. And, you know, just to speak of it, but people will always come into treatment and they're like, I can't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that is really using good judgment. Because based on what they've been through, you're right. You shouldn't trust. You need to, you're using really good judgment not to trust right away. But once they yes. see the information we're giving them and the love and the non judgment, they really begin to trust. So, what would you say? Um, at someone's watching this and this, you know, this, even this conversation could be intimidating, scary. Um, the whole process of surrender as you, as you call it, um, is incredibly intimidating. Um, so what is your message of hope for someone watching this who, this sounds great. This sounds you know, is this really possible? I'm sure that you run into a lot of people who have lost hope, can't trust anybody. How how do you talk them through even just the beginning bridge of making the phone call or reaching out for help? Isn't that an incredible challenge at the beginning? Yes. I mean, asking for help is the hardest thing any addict ever has to do. And I will say that if you don't take a risk, you're going to risk even more. And so, you know, sometimes what, what I say is, what is the worst that is going to happen? What is the worst? You're going to end up better or you're going to walk out the same. And 99.900%, you're going to always walk out to be a different person. And it's about trusting the process. It's making that first call. It's taking that first step, which is always going to be the hardest. And it takes so much courage and it takes so much faith and it takes so much hope um, to be able to do that. And I think that, you know, once somebody can kind of put down the bat and pick up the feather and give <laughs> themselves a break that that first step is so difficult, but then, you know, we're on the road to recovery with them. They don't have to do it by themselves. So once they step into our doors, we're there with love, we're there, you know, without judgment, and they don't have to do it by themselves. And that's the most beautiful part, that they're making a choice for their lives, for their recovery. And all we say is all they have to do is take one day at a time and sometimes just one minute at a time. Andrea Horowitz, I want to thank you for coming on and having this conversation. I always enjoy speaking with you um, and I'd love to have you on again. And I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. 